the Board of Regents will reconvene. Uh, at this time, we have the public comment uh, section. Uh, we will have uh, public comment uh, before the board meeting. The board recognizes the opportunity for expression of public views on issues that come before the board is an, op is an important part of its deliberations. Each presenter is limited to three minutes of time. We will now open the microphone for the first presenter. Claire Miller. My name is Claire Miller. I am an undergraduate student at the University of Iowa and the Disability Constituency Senator elect for UI student government. I am addressing your board today to inform you that the University of Iowa has been unconscionably negligent in meeting the needs of students with disabilities. Their Office of Student Disability Services, under the direction of Dr. Mark Harris, arguably provides the least amount of support and services of any peer institution or Big Ten University. You can see this clearly embodied in their mission statement on page one. SDS primarily functions to provide accommodations as mandated by federal law, little more. As you can see throughout pages one through three, this is the most limited mission statement of a disability service office at any comparable institution. Most offices aim to make all aspects of university life equally accessible to students with disabilities. If you flip to page four, you can see that the mission of SDS is more limited than that of Iowa State University as well. ISU actually offers students with disabilities far more services than the University of Iowa. They have an exam accommodation center. Iowa does not. ISU has departmental liaisons for student accommodations. Iowa does not. ISU offers an allergen notification to reduce the chance that a student will have a severe allergic reaction in one of their classrooms. Iowa does not. ISU employs eight staff members and two graduate assistants in their disability services office. Iowa employs five staff and no graduate assistants. I should emphasize that absolutely none of this information was difficult to find, which tells me that some employee at the University of Iowa has likely known they've been continually underserving students with disabilities. That's how I arrived at my initial statement of unconscionable negligence. Moving on to your fifth page, you can see an infographic created by students with disabilities that enumerates various barriers they perceive at the University of Iowa. I'm personally concerned about maltreatment by faculty and staff. Now, most disability services offices would attempt to address some of this, but as I've stated, that's not traditionally what the role of student disability services has done. Page six demonstrates that disability concerns pop up in university-sponsored surveys, and pages seven through 10 are just a random assortment of various complaints, grievances, and suggestions that I've collected from various students in the past three months. These four pages represent about a tenth of what I've heard. I shouldn't need to say this, but absolutely nothing I've discussed should be acceptable to your board. Students with disabilities should be a valued part of diversity at Iowa. They should have an equitable, inclusive, and accessible experience at your public institutions. They should be actively welcomed, supported, and celebrated for their contributions to these universities. They should not have to do what I'm doing today and take time off of work to address your board because of the excessive number of unacceptable grievances they've experienced at one of your institutions. Thank you. Karina Foster Middleton.
My name is Karina Foster Middleton. I am a disabled undergraduate student in biomedical engineering and a member of the Dean of Students Student Advisory Board at the University of Iowa. I'd like to thank Claire Miller for beginning the initiative to speak here today and laying out the problem so thoroughly. Clearly, there are issues at the University of Iowa that have gone on for too long. What perhaps surprises me the most is that many seem to be unaware of these issues at all, issues that impact disabled students' lives so severely, my life, that accessibility is difficult across campus, that the culture of the university discourages students from both seeking and using their accommodations, that disabled students feel forgotten and uncared for. The number one thing I have been told when seeking solutions is that there is no money. No money for accessible renovations, no money for programming or services equivalent to dis disability services provided by peer institutions. It feels like being told that our needs are too expensive and not important enough. We would like to ask the board to consider specifically earmarked funding for accommodation and accessibility on state campuses, in addition to providing funding and support for a number of initiatives that I'll detail and that you have in front of you. We, along with Dr. Shivers at the University of Iowa, have just begun exploring the possibility of a mandatory disability education program for faculty and staff at the University of Iowa. <coughs> if we can preempt ableism, preempt misunderstandings about accommodations, we can take the onus of education off of disabled students where it shouldn't have been in the first place. I believe this is something that the board should consider providing programmatic support for and eventually expand across all three state universities. If the culture at the University of Iowa has these issues, I guarantee that the culture at UNI and ISU will have similar concerns. The only way to address this is education. Claire Miller, in her online comment, brought up the graduation rates for students with disabilities are not tracked at the University of Iowa. I was also unable to find them for ISU or UNI. To my knowledge, that conversation has been started at the University of Iowa, and I look forward to the results statewide. We would also like to provo propose providing support for expanding the Excelling at Iowa survey program, which identifies and matches vulnerable students to on-campus resources. Traditionally, only first-year and transfer students receive this program, while TRIO students, an easily identifiable vulnerable group, receive it every year. We believe disabled students would also benefit from receiving the survey yearly, but that requires money and manpower, which we have been told we do not have. Furthermore, we would like to start the conversation about using the UG CERU data to design institution-specific surveys aimed at disabled students. These would track how student satisfaction changes while these large cultural shifts are attempted. Finally, we would also like to strongly encourage the Board of Regents to consider adopting a standard for student disability services that state institutions would be required to meet. There should not only be student equity, but institutional equality, and disabled students should choose a school because of the programs, not because of where they are best accommodated. We look forward to a time when that is the case and look forward to being part of the conversation. Kathy Glosson. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Glosson, president of SEIU Local 199, the union that represents nearly 4,000 registered nurses and healthcare professionals at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. I began my nursing career at UIHC in 1982. From the start, I felt incredibly fortunate and lucky to work with such a skilled and dedicated team of healthcare professionals. But before long, it became clear that the hospital administration wasn't listening to us. They were not making decisions informed by our experience. So 20 years ago, I joined with my coworkers and together we formed our union to be more powerful advocates for our patients. In the years that followed, we had our disagreements with the administration, but we forged a constructive relationship. We jointly bargained contracts that established strong and clear professional standards at the hospital. Unfortunately, that relationship has been all but destroyed in the last few years. In 2017, when Iowa politicians passed the law attacking public employees, the Board of Regents and UIHC had a choice. You could take the high road, as many other public employers did, and continue to work with your staff. Or you could take the low road and attack us, 
You chose the low road, and it's had devastating impact. During my three decades working with staff at university hospitals, I don't think I have ever seen the staff so demoralized. Your decision to disregard our contract in 2017 paved the way for sneak attacks on employees' sick leave and overtime pay. And your refusal to bargain a full and fair contract in our recent negotiations came as another blow to the caregivers. Let me be clear, these attacks are driving away staff and threatening to undermine patient care. Turnover among medical lab scientists has grown so severe that one shift in the core lab has no experienced staff left to mentor the new scientists. The hospital has grown so reliant on traveling nurses that some units have actually had travelers working as charge nurses. That in no way is the correct way to staff a hospital and provide continuity of care. Sadly, we see the same lack of concern for staff at other areas at our university as well. The non-tenure track faculty and our sister union, SEIU Faculty Forward, have proposed a fair medical leave policy, a policy that creates a sick leave bank just like the one that already exists at UNI. But so far, the University of Iowa has refused to implement this policy. As a nurse and a healthcare provider, I know how crucial it is that people facing life-threatening illnesses have time to rest, have time to receive care, and aren't forced to go back to work before they're ready. The choice here seems obvious. Embrace a fair and humane policy that supports your faculty, and I hope you'll make that same choice for the UI healthcare professionals at UIHC as well. It's time to end the attacks on your staff and work with us to rebuild the relationships that have served Iowa's patients, our families, and the students of this university so well. Thank you. Elena Carter. Hi, my name is Elena Carter. I'm a lecturer in rhetoric here at the University of Iowa, and I'm here to read a statement on behalf of one of my colleagues in rhetoric, Steve McNutt, who cannot be here himself today. <coughs> in late October of last year, I received a serious cancer diagnosis. I started treatment immediately and was told by my oncologist that as soon as possible, I should plan to stop working. My immune system would be immediately compromised and the halls and classrooms of EPB are no place for a person with a compromised immune system. The diagnosis raised another question. If I can't work, how do I pay my bills? Disability pays 60% of a person's salary, but you have to be fully out of work for 90 days to qualify. Putting aside how I might get by on 60% of a lecturer's salary, what would I do for the next three months? The obvious answer was sick leave. The problem was that even though I've taught at the university in various capacities since 2004, I've only been full-time faculty for a year and a half when I was diagnosed. In total, I had 168 hours of sick leave, or 4.2 weeks. But have no fear, there was a solution. Person after person in CLAS, faculty and staff, had the same suggestion. Use the catastrophic sick leave program. It's great, they said. Your colleagues can donate time. As you might expect, learning such a thing exist existed was a huge relief. Aside from the practical benefits, it captured the idea that I was not alone and that when things get tough, we really do have each other's backs. It also wasn't true. The current program is structured so that vacation time is donated and converted to sick leave. Why sick leave can't be donated and used as sick leave was never explained to me. But since I'm a lecturer and since lecturers don't accrue vacation time, that meant I couldn't donate. If I couldn't donate to the program, I shouldn't expect to benefit from it. That, I was told, would be unfair. And we want things to be fair and equal, right? Speaking with the benefits office, I offered suggestions. After all, if faculty explicitly state they want to help a colleague, shouldn't they be allowed to do so? Can't we figure that out? You know the answer. In fact, the response from the person who told me I didn't qualify was not to suggest options or who else I might talk to, but to ask that I provide a list of people who had told me I qualified so she could call them and correct them. By the way, I declined to offer names, and if I had, it would have been a list of virtually everyone I know in CLAS, and that's a problem. 97% of faculty in CLAS do not qualify for catastrophic leave, yet it is a common misconception that almost everyone in CLAS thinks they have a form of support they do not have. Besides the obvious benefits to those who have served this university and are sick or injured, creating a sick leave bank like that at the University of Northern Iowa, accessible to every employee at the university, would be a policy that is truly fair and equal. 
There are moral arguments to make this change, and they are the best arguments, but consider all the ways in which this changes in the university's best interest. Eliminating a policy that treats people with similar jobs differently from one another would send a message of respect. It would demonstrate what we all want to believe is true, that this community is a community. Isn't that who we want to be? Isn't that who we are? Or to put it more bluntly, if the Panthers can do it, why can't the Hawkeyes? Thank you. Zachary Meyer. My name is Zachary Meyer. I've been a lecturer here for the past three and a half years. In the spring of last year, I went to the bathroom and was startled to see the toilet covered in blood. The urology department doctors were concerned enough that they scheduled me for an appointment the next day. When I arrived, I found out that they were so concerned because, despite my age, my symptoms seemed to point to the possibility of bladder cancer. After several procedures, we were all relieved to discover that it was just a kidney stone. I say just, and it certainly was preferable to the alternative, but the rest of that semester was painful, to say the least. My teaching suffered that semester. I was less creative, I was less engaged with my students, I rarely graded assignments in a reasonable amount of time, and I was unable to contribute to many service and research activities with my colleagues. However, I didn't take time off because I was afraid of being left with too little sick leave to cover a more serious emergency. And the next semester, something more serious did happen. I fractured my dominant hand. I'm not sure if you've ever tried to teach writing and grammar in a foreign language using only your non-dominant hand, but I can assure you it's actually harder than having a kidney stone. But that semester, I was lucky. I had a supportive DEO who arranged for a scribe to help me with grading. I had supportive colleagues who helped me with both scholarly and mundane tasks. But most importantly, I had sick time saved up. But uh, luckily, I had not had any serious illness in the first three years, so I had hardly used any before that point. Luckily, my DEO arranged so that I could decrease my teaching load by one-sixth and use sick leave to ensure that my pay did not also decrease. But what if I hadn't been so lucky? What if I had hit my head rather than my hand and needed the long, slow recovery that often comes with a brain injury? What if I had actually had bladder cancer? What if I hadn't had a supportive DEO? What if I hadn't had supportive colleagues? What if I hadn't been working at the university long enough to have enough sick leave time saved up? What if I had supportive colleagues, but not enough sick time, but they were willing to donate sick time to me, but they couldn't because of university policy? If I had been less fortunate in any of those circumstances, I can tell you what would have happened. Because the university has decided not to prioritize faculty salaries, especially for instructional track faculty, my household income is nearly $20,000 less than the median in Johnson County. This means that even in an only mildly unlucky scenario, for example, let's say I was able to maintain five-sixths of my normal teaching load, but wasn't able to use sick leave for that one-sixth. That would reduce my salary to a level where we could not afford our mortgage. And I know what you're thinking before you think it. We live in a condo that was half the price of the median home in Johnson County. We have one car. It has 250,000 miles on it. We've never been able to even come close to the contribution limits on a traditional IRA. And we haven't been able to save one cent in my son's 529. Establishing a sick leave bank is the right thing to do. Faculty should not have to choose between saving for our children's education or saving for a med medical emergency. We should not have to choose between saving for an illness or saving for retirement. We should not be one unlucky situation away from losing our home. So I'm asking you, do we really want to be an institution that punishes teachers for being unlucky? Do we want to send the message to our students that it doesn't really matter who's in front of them in the classroom or how that person is feeling? Do we want to send the message to our students and to our state that if you get sick at the wrong time, you're on your own? Do we want to prevent people from giving their resources to someone in need, especially when it will cost the university nothing? I hope not. Andrew Lewis. My name's Landon Elkind. Here's a handout. The Iowa Board of Regents should insist on the creation of a catastrophic leave bank at the University of Iowa, and the board should insist on its creation now. 
I wish to clarify how reasonable this policy is. We're not talking about a sick leave bank for short-term illnesses. I had the flu last week. I worked through it. My colleagues have done this too. We love our students. We teach them despite short-term afflictions like the flu. This sick leave, sick leave bank is only for catastrophic illnesses. It is also chiefly designed to cover workers for severe and debilitating illness throughout the 90-day period before they can qualify and apply for long-term disability. Until that 90-day period is up, they often have no recourse. Many of us, like myself, do not accrue paid leave because we have annual or semester contracts. Faculty that do accrue paid leave have to work over five years to cover that 90-day period. As for the costs and impact of the sick leave bank, we need look no further than the University of Northern Iowa to see that a catastrophic sick leave bank would work exactly as intended. It no doubt helps recruitment for tenure track faculty too. It would be quite good to tell potential hires during orientation with human resources that in case of all the curveballs that life throws at you, you're covered. That would be a simple response that shows respect and care for the faculty. It would no doubt save costs, employees and their supervisors that currently have to figure out solutions on a case-by-case -case basis would have a uniform, simple, intelligible procedure to follow that governs all cases. Now I want to speak to the urgency of this. What happens to University of Iowa employees that lack paid leave and unpaid leave but get catastrophically ill? The answer is that nobody knows. There is no uniform policy at the University of Iowa, and this is causing real harm now. Here's a concrete example. My lovely wife, Jill, she works on a semester contract here. She does not accrue vacation or sick leave. She does not qualify for unpaid leave under FMLA because her time worked here resets every summer. She never hits the 1,250 hours required to be eligible for FMLA leave at the University of Iowa. The thing is, she and I would like to grow our Hawkeye family. We met at the University of Iowa, we fell in love here, and we got married in Old Capital last May. We would like to have kids, but what if Jill gives birth or has a C-section on a Wednesday? and she does not show up to work on Thursday. Will she get fired for not showing up to teach? The answer is nobody knows. The University of Iowa has no uniform policy for such employees, so we're all left in the lurch. So I urge the board to take up this question. Will the University of Iowa fire my wife the day after she gives birth if she does not show up to teach? Create a catastrophic sick leave bank so that we can answer this ur urgent question with an unambiguous no. Andrew, Andrew Lewis. Hi, my name is Andrew Lewis. Um, I'm a lecturer in the ESL programs and a member of Faculty Forward Iowa. Um, I had to deal with the sick leave policy in 2019 after I broke my leg. Um, I had been working at the university for a little over a year and had just enough sick leave to cover the two weeks that I needed to miss. Uh, my situation wasn't a very long-term situation, and I'm grateful that my department was accommodating. But not everyone is, for lack of a better word, uh, lucky enough to get sick or hurt at the right time. Um, you've heard many examples of worse situations um, today, in fact, but even something as little as two weeks can be financially stressful, especially for those new to the university. Um, I'd like to remedy that. Um, as we've mentioned before, we look to the example of the University of Northern Iowa, where their administration actually does work with collaboratively with the faculty union. Um, to improve working conditions on campus. Um, one outcome of this has been a sick leave bank, exactly the change that we've um, recently asked university administration to implement. Um, we've spoken to our colleagues at UNI, and they have confirmed that their sick leave bank has, in fact, solved the problem that we're laying out here today. It provides a safety net for faculty who are long-term, or suffering <laughs> long-term illness, and those faculty who have work, uh, haven't worked here long enough to accrue enough sick leave to cover their needs. So I'm here to do what the UI administration has asked us to do, take our concerns to the Iowa Board of Regents. Um, I'm here to ask you personally to decide to provide adequate coverage um, or adequate support for faculty in this institution when dealing with and recovering from debilitating illness or significant bodily harm. In other words, I'm asking, asking you to treat UI faculty with dignity. The question that I want to ask all of you, individually specifically, is will you use your power as members of the Board of Regents to direct the University President, Bruce Harold to implement a sick leave bank and give UI faculty the support that our colleagues at UNI already receive? Um, however, I only have three minutes, so for lack of a better word, um, I will address the President of the Board, Michael Richards. Uh, Mr. Richards, will you use your power as President of the Board of Regents to direct University President Bruce Harold to implement a sick leave bank and give the University of Iowa faculty the support that our colleagues at University of Iowa, nope, University of Northern Iowa already receive? Please answer yes or no.
right? The University of Iowa administration has used you all as cover for their own inaction. At the very least, will you make it clear to UI administration that you won't stand in the way and that if they so decide, they're clear to implement the changes that we're asking for? All right, sounds good. Thank you. Zachary Rochester. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zachary Rochester, and I'm an undergraduate student here at the University of Iowa. I am speaking today um, standing in solidarity with uh, faculty members at our, my university. From the perspective of an undergraduate student, university faculty seem to be the ones who truly care for students. Uh, the ones that truly care about this institution are the ones that strive to maintain the integrity of higher, um, of higher education. Faculty are the ones who have dedicated their lives to this work because they are invested in the positive impacts of education and the outcomes of their students. I'm wondering what message it sends to undergraduate students when our institution fails to provide for our closest allies here on campus. Students are anticipating an increase in tuition of 5% every year for the next five years, a decision made by this board, which um, you can look at more in the handout that I gave you. Um, yet payment for faculty remains inadequate, protections for faculty diminish, and faculty members are forced to fight for reasonable sick day policies. In fact, the UI sick, policy, or sick leave policy offers less security for full-time, non-tenure track faculty with academic appointments than 10 out of the 14 Big, school, big Ten schools. Also see the uh, handout that I gave you as well for further information on that. Recently, in the face of, hands, of hate speech on campus, students have begun to ask, does you Iowa love me? Today, I am asking the question, does you Iowa love its faculty members? I think it's silly to um, expect the university to advocate for students when students don't advocate for faculty. If the current treatment of faculty on our campus is love, I would say it's an awfully warped version of it. Thank you. Sarah Castro. Hello, my name is Sarah Castro. I'm a student and I'm an organizer with Iowa Student Action. I'm originally from California, but because of exclusionary tuition models at universities there, much like the multi-year tuition model you all voted for here in Iowa, I was priced out of going to school in my home state and am now so far away from my home and my family because we were left with no other choice. And now that I'm going to school in Iowa, a place that I love and have now considered to be my home, I am saddened and outraged to see the same type of inaccessible model of education hurting more students here. We, Iowa Student Action, at the last board meeting had a number of questions about the damaging effects of the multi-year tuition model to the people on this board passed and we have still not received answers. Meanwhile, the livelihood of students is at stake every day that goes by and young people in Iowa are worried about how they're going to pay off their next tuition bill. Iowa Student Action is here to support the non-tenure track faculty here at the University of Iowa in their fight for a just medical leave policy. We share a vision for a more just and fair public education system. As the people on the front lines of this issue, actively engaged in the public education system, we know the damage that the Board of Regents is doing and it is time that the Board of Regents seriously addresses and prioritizes the needs of faculty and students. The people who are making Iowa public education good instead of filling the pockets of the corporate interests that back this board. We see you. Tuition increases have made $91 billion revenue between 2016 and 2018 from 2018. At this campus, the University of Iowa, this campus is in the bottom five out of 377 selected public universities in the percent of students from the bottom 20% of family incomes, very clearly pricing people out of your public institution. In effect, this has drawn more students from the upper 20% of family incomes and forced lower income students to take out more loans. Specifically through Iowa Student Loans, with some members of this board have connections to, regents are putting their own self-interest before the needs of students and, students and profit, 
the students, and are profiting off of their connections to Iowa student loans. And when you come to these Regents universities to talk about public education, when you have these monthly meetings, it is not you that is putting your lives on the line. The decisions that you all make put the fate and future of faculty and students who are on campus every day while you are only coming around every couple of months. And I really wonder, when you have these big meetings, are you thinking about the students who have to regularly, regularly make a decision between buying food and paying a tuition bill? Or your, or your faculty members who have to decide between caring for their health or their financial stability? Larry McKibben, you're an alum of the University of Iowa. How can you sell out your own students like this? And I am glad that we are getting another student regent on the board and hope, and hope that they will care much more about protecting the interest of students than you, Rachel. I know the student body at the Board of Regents that you are here to represent censured you for voting against their interest to increase tuition. So we are asking to you to reverse the multi-year tuition model, respond and answer to our questions, meet with us and we can start creating this better vision for Iowa education together. We've already talked to you about this and I'm not here for empty words. We want to see things move. Thank you. President Richards, that is our last scheduled speaker. Thank, thank you to all the uh, speakers. We appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. Well, we are going to come to order. Next item of business is the consent agenda. Are there items the board members would like to remove from the consent agenda for a separate vote? President Richards. Regent Bates. President Richards, I would like to remove item number 12, University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital revised budget, please. A motion and second are required to remove recognize what you said. A motion and second are required to approve and receive items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I so And this move. includes all items except item 12. I so move. I'll okay. second. Regent Bates, Regent Johnson, seconded. Are there, is there any discussion about the consent agenda? Regent, I'll do a roll call vote. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent County? Yes. <laughs> Regent Dakovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Johnson? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent McKibben? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Uh, Regent Bates has called for item 12 to be removed from the consent agenda. A motion and second are required to approve and receive them the item. Number 12, is there a motion? So moved. A motion by Regent McKibben and Regent, second. second by Regent Bates. Any discussion? <coughs> Bruce, uh, Harold, President Harold, would you, have, do you have a few minutes to give an update on item 12? If you, if you're comfortable being there, you can come up here too, if you'd like. Whatever's the most comfortable. Thank you. Give me a moment. I want to untangle some issues, once again, on this issue. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I would strongly recommend that the board approve the amounts in that item 
to increase the budget to so we can actually start paying a number of people that we owe money to and in one particular case we've actually come to an agreement and I'll cover that in another um, I will withhold that payment here's what's going on first of all we have a children's hospital I think you all know that and this is work that's related to that children's hospital it's a wonderful facility we have patients currently every day in that, in that hospital. And we have had some concerns about some of the work, and we've had to deal with those concerns on an ongoing basis. As it relates to merit, we've come to an agreement to settle that, and we, I, we will pay them that agreement in the next 24 to 48 hours. Part of that agreement is they have agreed to give us all of the construction documents that we need to continue to operate the facility in a safe way. In particular, those are documents relating to what they did, what's behind the walls, where are pipes, where are electrical conduits, and all the rest. There are a, a, a litany of complex issues to document what they did and then when there is, and if there ever is a leak or any other concern, we know what's behind the wall. We know exactly where pipes and valves are, and we can go address those. Without those documents, we are working in, in a blind way. All of our contractors agree to give us that documentation before they begin work. And in the Merritt case, they have agreed that those documents will be uh, handed over to us as soon as we pay them in the 24 to 48 hours I mentioned earlier. I will tell you that there is a complexity because the other vendor that I'm gonna talk about in a second is not agreeing to give us those documents. And some of Merritt's work is depending upon that other contractor's work so that Merritt knows what their work really is. There's a codependency here. I hope I, I said that clearly. So there is some possibility that the second vendor, Modern Piping, may not cooperate with Merit to give them the, docu the documentation they need to give us the documents that they've committed to give us. Nevertheless, based on that agreement that we've reached and they're working with us in good faith, I believe the right thing to do is to pay Merit, as I said, expeditiously. And they will then give us those documents. Modern piping is a very different issue, and you can begin to see the issue. They have decided that we've agreed that we will pay the entire amount that the court ordered. It's over. We're, we're going to pay that amount. We also are also demanding that the documents of construction that detail what's behind these walls be delivered to us, as they originally agreed to in their contract. We've talked to them quite a bit over the last few days, maybe over the last year and a half. And to be quite honest with you about it, and maybe a little too blunt for a public forum, but I really feel like they're playing games. They specifically said in a conversation today that they wanted an extra 500 to $2 million beyond what the court ordered to deliver us those documents that were in the original agreement. They have also said if some of you may remember that they want public, I'm trying to remember, some of you may remember, uh, several months ago and said that they were going to hold, they're going to get a sheriff's order to seize the mural. Um, they have re reiterated that in the last week or so, saying that they're going to get a sheriff's order to seize the mural in South Carolina, where it's on display. I've kind of had it here. And so I actually fully am prepared to pay what we owe them, but I also want in return the construction documents. And it's not just a normal building. There are patients in this. There are kids. And we've, as I said, we've had a couple of leaks. At one point they said they would give us glasses that they would pay for so that we could see what's behind the wall. I'm sorry. This is just not right. As a steward of the state and the state's assets, I just don't, we're prepared to pay. I'm prepared to put it in escrow to a third party. 
but I also want them to deliver the documents that we need to op operate that hospital on a continuing basis safely. Therefore, I need your approval to increase the amounts to the full budget level to cover this, but I would like your authority to pay merit and understanding that I will hold back until we get the appropriate documents from Modern Piping. I hope I covered everything. I hope that was clear. I'd be glad to take questions from anyone. Are there questions? Regent McKibben. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't think I can believe what I just heard. As a lawyer, I would assume that we always, that you got those at all times at the beginning of a construction project. And is that what you were just telling No, they us? actually, Regent McKibben, are, are delivered to us at the end of the construction project, the, when they've actually done all of their work and they've documented all the way through. But it was agreed to at the beginning. Right. But, but they, we had the ending, we're having the settlement, and we're not getting it without a whole lot more money. That's they want more money us. or a mere, yes, yes. They're, they're withholding it for a higher payment than the court agreed that, that we should pay them. I can't believe what I heard because that, as far as I'm concerned, that's extortion. Uh, I don't know what you think about it, but uh, as a lawyer, I, uh, that's extortion. And uh, I don't think as a regent, at, at least I'm speaking for myself, I know what my other colleagues think, but uh, for me, that's, that's a no. Uh, we, I'm yeah. not about to have the regents and our universities start taking extortion from people. As some of you know, I taught corporate strategy for a number of years. Um, we have a phrase in corporate strategy, when one person has an enormous amount of power over the other and over, overtly exercises that power, and it's called a holdup. It's a technical term we use in strategy. That's what's going on here. We're being held up for more money to deliver documents that were agreed to way at the beginning when they originally won the contract to do the work. There could be a possibility that they didn't document the work as they agreed to do. I don't have any evidence of that, but I, it does cause me to wonder what is really going on here. I, I said earlier they're playing games. I have used uh, in some of my meetings the extortion word as well. This isn't right. But at any rate, we really want to settle this. We, we have an obligation and, and fully recognize the authority of the court, and we've agreed to, to settle for exactly that amount. And we also have a contract that Modern Piping signed when we originally started doing the work. And they deliver, we're fine. And I will quickly authorize payment. And if they don't trust us, which could be something because it's been going on a while, and I have no idea why they wouldn't trust us because it's the state of Iowa at the, at the end of the day. But if for some reason that's a problem, we'll put it in a third party's hands and there are a few bankers here in the room that know how that process works and, that, and that'll happen. But we can't get there because they want more money. Well, I can tell you on, 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 from my side of things, I, I agree with you 100% and uh, I'm hoping my colleagues will stand up for you uh, because we're not gonna be extorted on, on something like that. And th that's clearly what it is. Thank you. Well, President Harold, I have a question. Um, so you're saying that we don't know what's behind the walls and they're not providing a detailed, it's called as built, but detailed drawings of what's behind the walls that they said that they did for the work for the construction for the hospital. Is that correct? 100% accurate, and these documents are technically referred to as as built, i.e., what's there as built, so that you actually have the knowledge before, if an emergency were to occur, what's behind the wall. Yep. There are other documents than just as built. Just to, I, I don't want to. There are other documents like we would like to file and believe all the way along that this has been a a Leeds certifiable building. There's a process for sending documents to the, the authorities that can go through that process. Um, they agreed also by contract to give us those documents so we could get that certification for this building. 
Uh, so there are other documents as well, but the ones that really concern me from a public safety perspective are the as-built construction documents. Are there regent debates? Yeah. Um, so just so I have this in my mind, they agreed to this. Yes. With the project that this would be done. This is a best practice done by all companies when buildings are built. Yes. Would you say? Yes. Yes. It's a standard practice. All our standard contractors hold to it. We've never had a problem with this. Never had a problem. I'd have to get some help from somebody right behind me. But how many contractors, Rod, how many different bid packages were on Children's Hospital? Is he there? Yeah. I, yeah. Excuse me. In that project, uh, dozens. Uh, and we execute hundreds of projects each year. Uh, the regents do this constantly. It's a regent contract document uh, with our contractors. And all of them include in the provisions of the contract uh, uh, signed on by the contractor who is the low responsive bidder uh, for post-construction as-built documents which are, they're complicated as you can imagine, especially in a project of this scale, but they are always delivered before we close out that project and we're in the position of paying without those and, um, and have been, in fact, have had those held over us as part of the negotiation process and now as we pay, uh, we're, it's being indicated that, that they don't want to give us those. Is it also correct that they have indicated that to us that they've actually delivered those documents to us? Yeah, it, and that goes back and forth. In the last, um, if, if we've been talking with Modern Piping. I personally have, Mr. Leonard's has as well for quite a while, and all the way along, they acknowledged they needed to give us those documents. They would do so when we paid. We had a disagreement at one point on the amounts, and the other point after we agreed on the, the amount of payment, they disagreed on some, on, on some of the language in there, and then ultimately the court cleared a lot of that up for us. And, uh, and so there's never been a dispute about them giving it. Then in the last uh, 48 hours, uh, one of their representatives, legal representatives, made a claim that we already had those documents. We went back, we went back through all of our people in the last 12 hours and said, are we sure that we don't have those? Are we sure? Uh, that the, our architect doesn't have them. We're sure, and I just, you can just see where we're going here. And Rod, um, once again, we've confirmed we do not have those documents. They're now trying to claim we do, but I don't think, I think maybe they backed that off as well. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird situation. It's pretty simple stuff. And yet now here we are. I think it's all about money. I think this notion that Regent McGibbons on is, is correct. There's some court filings and they missed some dates and they're paying some consequences I, perhaps for some of those, but that's not our issue, it's their issue. And I'm now into speculation. I should be. We don't have the documents and I don't think we should pay the money until we get the documents. Regent Dunkel. <laughs> so just so I'm clear about this, what we're expecting. Let's say you have a fire. And would you go to those documents then and say, okay, we know we've got this you could get this water here. Yes. If you had a catastrophe. If we had a leak, some of these some of these pipes carry gas, yeah. various types of gases in a hospital, as some of you well know. Yeah. And we have a leak of the gas line, yeah. or we have a water leak, or we have a fire, and we need to know what's behind that wall because there are gas lines, and if we hit the wrong line with yeah. trying to get what's to whatever's behind the wall, we could create a spark, and we could have a very not a good situation. So you're absolutely right, and that's the reason I'm saying no. By the way, I don't think any of you, when you build your homes yeah. or do work in your homes, <laughs> work as loosely as they're trying to get us to work. That is for goodness sakes, this is a children's hospital. That is not negotiable, President Harold. Thank you. Regent Johnson. I just have one quick question. Just so I'm clear in everything here, what you're asking us to do with this stocket item is to approve the expansion of the budget to meet both the costs um, for both suits as the court has ruled and modern pipings or merits will get paid 
in the next 48 hours or so, we'll Correct. say. And then modern piping will not get paid until we have those as built. Until I can look in your eye and say, we actually have those documents. And I'm, this is not about whether we have the money, whether we have the mm -hmm. uh, capability of paying. This has, it is solely, they deliver these documents, boom, that money is being wired immediately into their accounts. So I'm asking you to raise the budget appropriately because I think we'll ultimate, we owe this money. Mm -hmm. um, and we're prepared to pay it. Okay. But we also want to get what we pay for. So I'm asking you to approve the total budget. And if you will, to author and fully understand we'll pay merit quickly and we'll play modern as quickly as they commit to their side of the agreement. To their contract. Great, thank you. Regent Biker. Thank you. Um, do we have ways of, will it take a long time to make sure that we have the complete documents? I'm somewhat suspect of the documents at this point. It's another really good question. And I would say normally we would say we've got, you, you hand them to me, if, the third party would hand them to us and we say thank you very much and be maybe a, a, a courtesy. I think in this case we should take a, a little bit of time, maybe a day, and at least make sure that, we re that they really are as detailed as they're supposed to be and delivered. Um, and I hate to say that, but I think trust is wearing thin here. Yes, and even if we get a USB file, which often they're delivered in a USB file, we're going to put them in a computer and make sure that they they really are there, and they somebody hasn't put some sort of virus. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's going to be the case, but I think we have. To. Just so I understand, mm -hmm. if if all lots of times these documents just come on a thumb drive or uh, you know, so one one mm -hmm. or two would handle all everything, and if they wanted to provide this, all it would be is to, uh, you know, download onto another thumb drive and give it to you. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. I'll make it even easier. I'll drive up personally. This isn't... To their offices also, right now and go pick a, them. No. And all the blueprints no. and all the stuff are there, but it's not like uh, creating a room full of paper. It's uh, no. maybe an hour on a computer or 15 minutes or... Five minutes. I could do an advertising for the for IBM here, but it, you know, a decade ago there was probably a lot of paper involved. Today it's all digitized, and it should be quite easy. And as I say, I'll, I'd be glad to personally go up and pick it up, and uh, with someone who knows how to actually read all the documents to make sure we got what we paid for. Regent yeah. Kevin. Well, it seems to me that within 24 or 48 hours, we ought after we have this vote, we ought to know whether this is extortion or not. And if they don't come up with it, either one or two things. They either didn't do it, don't have it, or they're extorting us. I, I, I can't see it any other way. Yes, sir. I understand. I agree. Regent I, Bates? I would just say it is non-negotiable. We have to have those as built. I understand. I've got my marching orders if you vote accordingly. Any other discussion, Regent Butcher? No. Thank you. Uh, Regent. Regent yes. So is the plan now? Do we vote on this, or yes. that's what we're getting ready to do now? Okay. I'm going to read the okay. the motion as it existed, and if somebody's willing to make that motion, then it said. Action requested approve the Stead Family Children's Hospital revised project budget of $392,700,000 and increase of $32,500,000 plus any additional interest that may accrue. That I, I so move. Second. Regent. Second. Regent Dunkel. Re, re, <laughs> Re <laughs> that region over there. Yeah, that region over there. Region Bates made that motion. Sorry. Now we're going to do a roll call vote on that motion. Uh, region Bates. Yes. Region Butker. Yes. Region County. Yes. Region Dakovich. Yes. Region Dunkel. Yes. 
Regent Johnson? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent McKibben? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. We're, we're moving on to the next agenda item. Uh, I would say that uh, in, in order for time, the institutional presidents have agreed to forego their uh, institutional reports, uh, and that's an uh, that's an agenda change. Do we need to? Uh, we'll just inform everybody of it. Okay. Uh, next item is the uh, president's report. And I would like to uh, read a statement. Uh, let me take a few moments to address uh, tuition rates. In November, we unveiled the new multi-year tuition model for resident undergraduate students. One of the keys behind our new model was predictability for students. Part of that predictability was insisting that this board was firm in the belief that tuition rates would be set at well, one time per year. We are not interested in setting tuition rates and then having to adjust them later. We will set tuition rates only one time per year. As I have previously said, we believe that we must look at total resources our universities need. In September, we made a state appropriation request of $18 million increase over our current uh, general appropriation budget. For next year, for our public universities, the tuition rates that we, are, that we will set are based on cooperation with the state. To recap our plan, for the University of Iowa and Iowa State University, the board has set guide rails on tuition. If the state fully funds the appropriations request, the 2019-2020 base resident undergraduate tuition rate will increase 3%. If the state provides no additional funding, the base resident undergraduate rate increases increase will be 3% plus the projected higher education price index, the HEPI, which is estimated at 2%. If the state partially funds the appropriation request, the base resident undergraduate rate will be somewhat within the range of 3 to 5%. For the University of Northern Iowa, if the state fully funds the appropriations request, resident undergraduate tuition would not increase for 2019-20. So we will set undergraduate tuition rates once we know that re what resources the state will be providing. We are working with the legislature and the governor's office on appropriations. And, and they are working right now to come up with an agreement. There will be budget clarity in the very near future. Our plan was to hold a first reading of tuition at this meeting. Unfortunately, we do not yet have enough information about what our state appropriation will be. We can call a special meeting as soon as possible, either late April or early May, to hold the first reading of the 2019-20 tuition rates. With approval of tuition rates at the June regularly scheduled meeting. It's important to note that the final approval date for tuition rates has not changed. I recognize this delay in a first reading of tuition rates is frustrating for students and families. However, we will move forward with tuition rates after we know what the state will provide to our institutions. Thank you. Are we okay with skipping the institutional heads based on what the time it's spent? Pardon me? Yeah, but okay, everybody's okay with that. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'd 
like to recognize uh, Council Amy uh, Clays. And will the presenters for the salary policy please join me at the table? So each of the five region institutions has groups of faculty and staff that are not organized for the purposes of collective bargaining. Representatives from these groups have been invited to speak to the board regarding salary policies for fiscal year 2020. Um, the following individuals will provide very brief presentations. Sandra Doc Hirsch on behalf of the UI Faculty Senate, Michael Heseltine on behalf of the UI Staff Council, Peter Martin on behalf of the ISU Faculty Senate, Amy Ward on behalf of the ISU Professional and Scientific Council, and um, J.C. Last on behalf of the UNI PNS Council, and Damian Blair on behalf of the Regents Interinstitutional Supervisory and Confidential Advisory Committee. And we will begin with the uh, University of Iowa Faculty Senate Representative Sandra Doc Hirsch. Thank you, President Richards and board members. I'm um, presenting Russ Gannum on behalf of Russ Gannum, our Faculty Senate President, um, has written remarks to you today. My name is Sandy Dak Hirsch. I am an associate professor at the College of Nursing and Sac Faculty Senate Vice President. This year and last, it has been Russ, Russ, Russ's pleasure to get to know most, if not all of you, in his capacity as Faculty Senate Officer. We are especially grateful to you for your support for our successful efforts in removal of the AAUP sanction levied on the University of Iowa in June of 2016. As we know, that sanction was lifted in June of 2018, and your collaboration in that endeavor is deeply appreciated. Regent Bates and Rachel Boone from the board office were especially instrumental in this partnership, and I wish to thank them personally for their time, their contribution, and their collegiality. Indeed, we all share a common bond, that of strengthening our universities to reinforce the commitment to educational excellence we've made to the citizens of the state of Iowa. My purpose today is to tell you about faculty at the University of Iowa, and in doing so, I'd like to share with you one example of how faculty excellence illustrates itself daily here at the university. In our Division of World Language, Literature, and Cultures, Russ is privileged every day to work with colleagues from all over the globe who make it their life's work to establish connections with people whose diverse experiences help create an inclusive atmosphere we promote and cherish here at the University of Iowa. Let me cite the work of one of our lecturers in our Spanish and Portuguese department, Millar Marseille. Pilar, excuse me. Pilar is an instructional track faculty, and as you know, the instructional track was formally approved three years ago in order to recognize on an institutional level the faculty whose, primarily, whose primary efforts consist of teaching. The institutional track has given our faculty a greater sense of security and helped stabilize our teaching core mission especially in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Originally from Spain, Pilar came to the university in 2006. She is a specialist in cur curricular design and foreign language teaching. With particular expertise in developing courses specific to purposes of business Spanish, medical Spanish, and Spanish for tourism. She's also a certified legal translator. Pilar's dedication to the profession does not end in the classroom. She's a widely published scholar in her own right, having co-authored book projects while writing journal articles and attending national and international conferences. Pilar's students regularly cite her dedication, her thoughtfulness, and her overall ability to teach Hispanic language and culture in a way that leaves them more curious about this part of the world and how these connections with Hispanic 
His Hispanic peoples increasingly shape the future of our state. Her work illustrates an unyielding commitment to humanities and humanistic inquiry. Just last month, Pilar's efforts were formally acknowledged by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences when she received the Collegiate Teaching Award, the highest honor each of our college, colleges can bestow for faculty excellence and in instruction. Pilar is, mo is most deserving, is certainly most, excuse me, Pilar most certainly deserves this recognition, this recognition for building bridges and strengthening bonds in a way that represents all of our faculty. We need to do all we can to retain faculty like Pilar and show them the appreciation they deserve. Senior administration has focused on faculty salaries in recent years, and we applaud such initiatives. It is important to remember, however, that the market for high achieving faculty is just as competitive as it is for any other, and we must continue to make every effort to attract the best possible faculty to our universities in order to maximize student success student opportunity. Investment in faculty is an investment in our state's future. Tomorrow's jobs start with the teaching and research our faculty conduct today. We are pleased that the Board of Regents, President Harold, Provost Curry understand this reality and thank them for their support. The willingness of the board and the senior leadership at the university to work with faculty and to practice shared governance makes our institutions stronger and places and places us in a better position to face challenges that lie ahead. It is in this spirit of collaboration that Russ would like to tout the accomplishments of our faculty and express his optimism as the university moves forward in service to the state. Thank you. And next we'll hear from um, Mr. Heseltine on behalf of the University of Iowa Staff Council. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, it's my sincere honor to come before the board today to speak on behalf of the hardworking and dedicated staff who I represent and whom I, I am accountable to. Uh, my name is Michael Hustletine. Um, as president of the University of Iowa Staff Council, I want to thank you for providing this time to share a few examples of what the more than 7,500 professional and scientific and merit exempt supervisory and confidential staff are contributing to the academic research and service missions of the University of Iowa and the great state of Iowa. First of all, healthcare. Uh, staff routinely manage access to care for all of Iowa's, all, all Iowans. Staff ensure UI Healthcare's patients receive the very best care and have safe and successful outcomes. UI Healthcare staff are care for nearly a million outpatients annually on our main campus and across the state at over 200 clinics serving patients from every county in Iowa. Research. Staff routinely lead and assist with cutting edge research in labs across campus and across the globe. They bring new discoveries from the labs to the real world applications and often to entrepreneurs and businesses that help fuel the state's economic engine. They also collaborate across regents institutions to solve problems that affect Iowans and to increase the state's national and global research profile. Academics, staff utilize data to attract the best students through focused and outreach and strategic campus visits. They work with university students to become successful in their transition to college, provide support to succeed in the classroom and manage their finances, and ultimately to graduate and shift successfully to a career or the next stage in their academic pursuits. Staff also manage the demands of technology, computer networks, and data and communication systems to reimagine the classroom, connecting students, businesses, and Iowans. Finance. Staff oversee the fiduciary responsibilities of the institution through best practices in accounting, budgeting, auditing, and planning. And staff work tirelessly to strategically collaborate across campus to find efficiencies in our processes and where to focus our resources for the greatest good. A couple of other additional uh, 
thoughts. Uh, staff provide leadership to help shape a diverse culture which is inclusive and equitable for everyone. And that drives excellence and innovation in our workforce by supporting talent development, engagement, and the enrichment of the staff experience. The University of Iowa staff, as University of Iowa staff, we represent and are committed to continuing to improve upon all that we do. And as you can see from that small sample I just read, we truly do it all. When we poll our employees, a common thread is how engaged our staff are. Our commitment and engagement notwithstanding, as employees who are supported partially through public funds, we are aware of the pressures placed upon our institution by increasingly limited state funding. Since 1998, the state budget has grown by around $3 billion, but funding for the UI has declined by millions despite enrolling thousands more students over that same time period. And while we have reason for some optimism about this year's budget, and thank everyone here, um, there are concerns about FY20. As we partner with university administration on new endeavors such as the public-private partnership, faculty and staff have concerns regarding the possibility of our state legislature paring back contributions in equal measure to any potential gains we may accomplish through such innovation. This unpredictable fiscal policy contributes to an uncertainty which is bad for business and could act as a detractor for outside investment in our state's region's institutions, which would then undermine the overall state economy. We need stable and predictable support and a sustained pathway in which we can plan strategically for the future. Consistent funding, including reasonable tuition increases, will only take us part of the way in that effort to maintain the UI as a flagship institution Iowans have come to expect. As staff, we accept that more will need to be done through our hard work and dedication by developing new philanthropic funding streams, by increasing access to healthcare while reducing costs, supporting research and commercialization opportunities, ensuring students remain focused on graduating in a timely manner, and continuing our efforts to find efficiencies in all that we do. As the President of Staff Council and a dedicated employee of the University of Iowa, I'm going to take a moment of privilege to tell you what public education has meant to me. Growing up in considerable poverty in a small industrial town in eastern Iowa on the Mississippi, I put myself through school starting at my local community college. While there, I received two associate's degrees. I then transferred to and attended the University of Iowa and graduated as a first generation student. I understand firsthand what a public education can do for an individual and the difference education has made in my own life. I ask for your commitment to my fellow staff through your support of adequate cost of living salary increases at or above the Midwest Consumer Price Index, meritorious service awards which encourage further innovation, entrepreneurship, and general engagement, and to provide a positive working environment through a continued strong benefits package, flexible, supportive, equitable employee work policies, and increased recognition and support of our diverse workforce. With the overall downward trend in public funding of higher education, this is not a time for complacency. And that's not directed at you. <laughs> to my fellow staff, I implore your awareness and engagement in the fiscal challenges we face. I encourage you to tell your stories to other Iowans regarding how you are making Iowa a better place to live and work. And to our Board of Regents, to you here before me today, I am thankful for your backing of funding of public higher education and ask you to remain steadfast in your support. I ask that you use your positions of influence to encourage our state elected officials to support one of the foundations of our state's economic engine. Thank you again for providing this opportunity to share my thoughts with you on behalf of the 55 dedicated staff counselors who represent the more than 7,500 University of Iowa uh, professional and scientific merit supervisor exempt and confidential staff who are unorganized. That sounds terrible. Who are non-organized. <laughs> um, that just put. Uh, 
Staff at the University of Iowa are ready to serve. Oh, finally, I want to leave you with a thought. Staff at the University of Iowa are ready to serve in all capacities as proven by our history. We love our university and we are dedicated to the state of Iowa. What we need is your support and the resources to make it all possible. We are ready for greatness, so the question is, are you with us? It is with sincere gratitude and appreciation of your support that I say, on Iowa and go Hawks. Thank you. Now we'll hear from uh, Peter Martin on behalf of ISU faculty. Thank you, President Richards, members of the Board of Regents. Thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of the faculty at Iowa State University concerning the fiscal year 2020 salary policy. My name is Peter Martin. I'm a professor of human development, university professor of human development and family studies, and I serve as the president of the faculty senate this year. I could easily spend my time today sharing with you statistics that indicate faculty salaries at Iowa State University are the second from the bottom among its peers. I could easily spend my time today highlighting that a peer comparison shows Iowa State professors trailing the top university salary of its peers by more than $40,000. I could also point out that 1% salary increase last year, the 0% salary non-increase two years ago, and low pay raises the past half dozen years are having a toll on faculty morale. I could easily use my short time to talk about the money. However, it is not just about the money. I want to remind you that our faculty are hardworking members of the academic community who go home after a long day at the university to start working again in the evening and on weekends preparing their classes, correcting papers, catching up on research. All faculty members care about their students and they are likely to drop everything when students stop by their office to talk about a problem or a question. It is not just about the money. It is about recognizing our dedicated, ambitious faculty whom we can count on every day. We are not superhuman. We do our work like most other Americans and we appreciate it when we are recognized for what we do. Low or no salary increases give us the message that we are not appreciated. We are not a priority at the university, nor perhaps with the Board of Regents. As a consequence, some excellent faculty members are leaving the university. As you know, we've had high numbers of faculty members resign at Iowa State for the last two years. In last year's report, we read that 44% of the faculty members who left Iowa State said their new position would pay much higher. When you're at the bottom of the pay scale among your peers, you can also not attract the best new faculty members to join us. And this hurts our students because we are compromising the student experience. Here's the primary question I want to ask you, our legislators, and all parents who sent their students to Iowa State University. Looking into the future, do you want our young adults in Iowa to be taught by the best professors we can hire and keep at Iowa State? Or are you satisfied with a future faculty that may well be below average. Do you want our future students to be engaged in the most creative, nationally recognized faculty? Or are you satisfied when the pool of applicants is reduced to those rejected by other universities? For our young adults, the years at Iowa State University are the most formative years. They are years that will determine their future the future as an employer or as an employee, the future as a father, mother, or single parent, the future of a well-rounded, well-educated citizen. It is about the student experience. 
Let me share a brief experience from my own work. I teach a large class of undergraduate students on the topic of aging. I challenge my students to find current publications in our field. And it is rewarding for me, and I also hope for them, when some of these students come to me and proudly announce, Dr. Martin, I found an article published by Peter Martin. Is that really you? We care about our students, and our students deserve the best. Our students at Iowa State express that they are paying a large amount for a good education, and that they expect high-quality professors, professors who are actually producing new knowledge in the field. And to provide the best, we need to support our faculty with salaries that tell them, we appreciate your work, we recognize that you are a leader in the field. We want to keep you at Iowa State, and we want you to attract others who strive for the best to come to Iowa State. Keeping the best at Iowa State also means that we need to do everything we can to keep a diverse group of faculty. We must strive for equitable salaries across all designations at the university. Gender, race, ethnicity, disability, age, the last salary report just released by the AEUP indicated that women associate professors at Iowa State University earn only 88.8% when compared to men. That is $11,189 less for women every year. Our women, fa our women faculty are often not as recognized and valued for their contributions our faculty of ethnically underrepresented groups continue to voice concerns, and older, productive faculty members are often pushed to the sidelines. At Iowa State, we strive for a university that is fair and equitable to all faculty who contribute so much to our mission. One important way to signify this is through equitable salaries. Members of the board, it is not just about the money. It's about how we value the hardworking faculty who do their very best to give students what they deserve, a great educational experience of a lifetime. To do so, we must retain and attract top-notch faculty. For those reasons, we believe that faculty salaries are our top priority. Catching up with our peers Every professor would need a salary adjustment of $13,300. And this would make us only average among our peer group. I hope that you know we strive to be an above average university. I urge you to do everything you can, and we have appreciated your support, to, to support our faculty with salaries that allow them to feel they're not the bottom of the barrel. The work of our faculty matters. It matters for the student experience. It impacts a faculty member's sense of loyalty, engagement, and drive toward excellence. I want our faculty to see we are moving up within our peer group because we believe that we at Iowa State University are among the best in our fields and can remain so in the future. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Ms. Ward on behalf of the ISU PNS staff. Good afternoon. On behalf of the over 3,000 professional and scientific employees at Iowa State University, I would like to thank you for the invitation to speak today. The professional and scientific employees at ISU are a vibrant, energetic, and enthusiastic group of people with a variety of responsibilities. From advising and advocating for students, conducting and assisting with research, and providing many types of outreach and direct assistance to people across Iowa and the world. We are dedicated to our work and are critical to the university's fulfillment of its mission of creating, sharing, and applying knowledge to make Iowa and the world a better place. Now more than ever, professional and scientific employees at Iowa State University are being asked to take on temporary duties, learn new processes, 
hold off on filling vacancies, and wear many, ha wear many hats. We face extraordinary change with the upcoming implementation of Workday and improved service delivery, which will change the way we do our work in ways we still are yet to fully understand. It's been a very challenging year as professional and scientific employees, for professional and scientific employees who continue to work directly with students and faculty, with research and with IONs, while awaiting changes to not only university processes and procedures, but on information on how their positions will change as a result of these changes at the university. This coupled with the lack of consistent salary increases dramatically affects employee morale, performance, and retention. The Iowa State Climate Survey completed in 2017 and reported in May 2018 provides important data for understanding the current campus climate as it relates to Iowa State staff. ISU staff had the highest response rate among the groups surveyed, with over 1,800 staff respondents. According to the survey, 50% of staff members have considered leaving Iowa State University. In fact, the top three reasons for desiring to leave all relate to employee compensation, including low salary and pay rate, limited opportunities for advancement, and increased workload. Only 23% of staff respondents perceive their salaries and childcare benefits as competitive. As employees of the state of Iowa, we are concerned when our institution's effectiveness and efficiency are being questioned, while the data shows that we are administratively the leanest university in our peer group. We have been doing more with less for several years, and now in the face of extraordinary change, it's an imperative that we find sustainable ways to retain, reward, and reward over 3,000 professional and scientific employees who are affecting every component of the Iowa State University mission and operation. President Winterstein recognizes the challenges we face and has remained committed to prioritizing salary increases for employees. I would like to ask the regents, everyone listening today, and everyone who reads the minutes from this meeting to make any efforts possible to acknowledge, recognize, and value professional and scientific employees and their contributions to our institutions to help us retain and attract highly productive and engaged professional and scientific employees and to continue to invest in the region's institutions to help make Iowa and the world a better place through the creation, sharing, and application of knowledge. Thank you. And uh, finally, JC Last on behalf of the UNI uh, PNS staff. Hello, my name is JC Last and I'm the president of the Professional and Scientific Council at the University of Northern Iowa. I'd like to start by thanking the board for inviting us all to be here today. We appreciate being given the opportunity to engage in direct dialogue with everyone here. Currently at UNI, there are approximately 750 professional and scientific employees spread across five divisions. These individuals make it their goal every day to help ensure that the students enrolled at UNI receive the best education we can possibly provide. The PNS community appreciates the efforts of the Board of Regents have un appreciate the efforts the Regents have undertaken over the past several years to help us ensure that we have the resources we need in order to do our jobs effectively and efficiently. The past couple of years, though, have been rough ones in terms of finding those resources. Smaller than average high school graduating class sizes and a focus on shrinking the state budget in the legislature have contributed to severe budget constraints at UNI. These constraints have led to positions not being filled when an employee leaves or retires, delayed or lower than normal salary increases, and a rise in anxiety among the employee population that fears they may be asked to take furlough days or, in the worst case scenario, that they may be laid off. One of the biggest reasons that former PNS employees chose to leave UNI is due to financial uncertainty. With salary increases being consistently less than the annual cost of living increase, the rising costs in sectors such as childcare and health insurance, many individuals choosing to leave you Many individuals are choosing to leave UNI for higher paying jobs in the private sector or at other regions' institutions. 
In an attempt to address this, last year, UNI's Human Resources Department worked with a third-party consultant to update and rework our compensation and classification framework, which was last updated in 1991. The new framework that was adopted works to tie an employee's salary to the market data that's available for similar positions in both the private and the public sectors. Many PNS employees saw their salaries brought closer in line with what they felt they should be paid based on what they were seeing advertised in the job market. This went a long ways towards reducing the uncertainty and unhappiness that was being felt among the PNS community in regards to their salaries. The current UNI administration is also doing a wonderful job navigating this budget hardship. President Nook and the rest of the executive management team are making a noticeable effort to be transparent about the decisions they are making, as well as attempting to share and explain the data they are using when making their decisions. They've also done a good job in reaching out and making sure the PNS community has a voice in the decision-making process alongside the faculty and merit organizations as well. This openness and honesty has gone a long ways towards rebuilding the trust that was shaken by previous administrations and helps PNS employees feel like they have a clearer sense of where the university is headed in the years to come. In closing, I'd like to again thank the board for all of their efforts over the past year to help ensure that UNI has the resources we need to continue to improve and thrive in today's academic climate. The work you're doing is essential to our success and helps build the foundation we need as we move forward with our goal of educating Iowans for Iowa and with providing the best education possible for any student who chooses to be Panther proud. Thank you all. I believe that concludes well, the presentation. I'd like to thank everybody that presented today. I hope you feel that this board is working towards your same goals. Maybe not quite as fast as you want, but we're getting we're we're, we're, we're working on the same team. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Jason Pontius, uh, who's going to. Uh, discuss the uh, region admission index and related issues. Thank you. I'll just sit low. All right. It's all right. Good afternoon. I'm joined here today by Matt Krager, um, Phil Caffrey, and Brent Gage from the universities to answer any other questions you might have outside of the RAI related to our admission system. But it's possible over the last few months that you've noticed there's been a little bit of controversy regarding college admissions. And so with, with that spotlight on the admission systems in general, we would like to talk a little bit about the region admission index and how that whole process works. It turns out that Iowa's got a long history of providing automatic admission for students that want to go to their four-year public universities. So starting back in 1958, Iowa code um, stipulated that a student who graduated in the top half of their high school class would automatically be admitted to any of the three public universities. Now in 2006, they put together a commission to look at that and see if there are some new ways we can kind of uh, approach the admission system. And as part of that, the RAI, or Region Admission Index, was created. And just to give you a little more of the history that goes in, so in fall 29, 2009 it started. Um, fall 2016, we added a no rank formula, and I'll go into some, a little bit of detail about that. And then coming up in summer of 2020, we are actually dropping rank altogether from the Region Admission Index. So the magic number with the index is to get to 245 or above. You get the 245 threshold and you're automatically admitted to any of the three universities. And we currently have two formulas. One is the primary formula, which was the original, and the other is the alternative or that no rank formula. 
And what we do is we provide weights or um, um, kind of multipliers to each of the different characteristics that go into the formula. Um, but the main ones being the ACT, high school GPA, and the high school core courses. Now the benefits of this are that beyond just looking at the top half of your class, there are students that go to very competitive high schools that have very strong academic records that might not otherwise be admitted automatically. This provides some flexibility. So if they have strong ACT scores or strong high school GPA, it would balance out that and, and provide automatic admission for them. The other big benefit and one that's very popular with um, guidance counselors are the core courses because what it allows for students to do is to take more college prep courses in order to increase their overall um, index score. In fact, it's one of the best and easiest ways to increase your score to get into one of the Regent Universities. As I said, in summer of 2020, we are getting rid of that primary formula altogether, and then the alternate formula becomes the only RAI formula. So we are dropping class rank. And as you may remember from a previous meeting, we talked a little bit about this, but we begin to see over time that fewer and fewer high schools were providing a class rank for their students. And I got to the point in fall of 2017 where about 50% of our applicants had no high school rank whatsoever. So we saw the writing on the wall and started moving to a formula that didn't need rank. So we basically reweighted the ACT and the high school GPA in order to still keep that 245 threshold for admission. Uh, we did keep the core course weight the same. So what are core courses? So in this case, it is a list, or kind of a master list of, of college prep courses in English, math, science, social studies, and world languages, courses that most college students are gonna need to take when they get to college. And what we're able to do with the cooperation with the Iowa Department of Education and Iowa State University is we go through and look at all, high, all public high schools and most of the private high schools, pull all the courses that they offer at their high schools, and then filter them. And so we then give a custom list to every high school in the state saying these are the classes that you offer that count toward the REI. This, for example, is the Ames High School core course list, and I've just kind of exploded out the English um, part of it as well, so you can see which type of classes are gonna count. So what happens is that that CU is a Carnegie unit, so that's basically the equivalent of a one there as a one year long course. Uh, and so each of those gets multiplied by five, and that counts toward your 245 for admission. Now once you've got your ACT score, once you've got your, um, your courses and your high school GPA, or even if you've got a decent guess as to what they're going to be, you can just go online at any time and use the RAI, RAI calculator to figure out whether you're hitting that 245 threshold. So if you're beginning of your junior year and you just plug in your junior year high, um, high school GPA and maybe you've taken the ACT or you've got a rough guess as to where you might place in that, you can put it in there and it's like, okay, if I'm a little bit low, maybe I need to take more college prep courses in my senior year in order to get my score above that 245. So it really allows a lot of transparency and the ability for students to plan ahead with their curriculum and understand where they, they stand at any given point in high school. So how does a student get to a 245? Um, one of, again, one of the great benefits here is that there are many different paths. Uh, the, kind of the average student at the 245 level is sometimes a 20 ACT, has a B average in high school, and has taken the average number of core courses for our, our university students, which is 19. Or, I think there's another possibility, um, you can have a higher ACT score to kind of balance out the fact maybe you didn't take as many, many of those core courses. Maybe you were taking more art classes or other, other classes that were outside of that core um, that were valuable courses, but they just didn't count. And again, you're able to balance it out with another, um, another different score. Here in this case, a higher high school GPA is able to kind of still, with a lower ACT, is able to still get you to the 245. And then finally, the um, higher ACT with the higher core courses um, is able to kind of balance out a lower high school GPA. Now, a 245 is not sufficient for automatic admission. There are additional minimum requirements that are needed um, in order to, for that automatic, in order to get into the universities. 
This is an example here of the mathematics part of those minimum courses, and you can see they're very similar to all three of our universities. We recommend four years of math in high school, but um, all three of ours will accept th um, three with kind of the algebra, geometry, and algebra two kind of being required. Now you can see under um, University of Iowa that their School of Engineering requires four years of mathematics, which is an additional, kind of, they want that trigonometry kind of pre-calc or calculus course. So what this means operationally is that a student who's applying who maybe only had three years of math would, and had the 245 would be automatically admitted to the University of Iowa, but they wouldn't necessarily be automatically admitted into the College of Engineering at that point. So several years ago, uh, Iowa State University took a little bit of an experiment and they started allowing students to self-report all of their metrics for the RAI. And that worked very well and the other universities um, kind of adopted the same formula. So basically a student applies to the university of their choice or multiple universities and they're able to tell, just put in the application, their, their grades, their ACT score, number of courses. And later, they know that those official scores and transcripts are gonna get reviewed by the universities. And if for some reason that information was incorrect, then those admission offers can be rescinded. Now that almost never happens. Um, and then the other benefit of it is it gives the universities the ability to let students know they've been accepted very, very quickly. In a matter of days, oftentimes within 24 hours uh, of putting in an application, they know that they're in. And I don't know, um, growing up in Virginia, um, that was not something that we had going for us. It was, you put your applications in the mail and waited three to four months and hoped that somehow you got something in the, in the mailbox. Now there's a common, so what happens if you have an RAI below 245? There's a common misperception that if a student doesn't get that 245, that they cannot get into one of our three universities. They're denied admission. Now it's important to remember the 245 is for automatic admission only, and the universities encourage all students to still apply, but what happens at that point is the universities then conduct a holistic review. And the universities understand that life happens, there may be extenuating circumstances that are affecting uh, a student's R uh, metrics for the REI score, but it gives them a chance to kind of go through and look at the whole student and determine whether that student is gonna be capable of doing college level work. So again, operationally, let's see how some of this breaks out. So in the fall of 2018, we had over 50,000 students applied to the Regent Universities. Over 43,000 were admitted. About 12,500 were enrolled. And of that, 776, or 6%, had a RAI below the 245. And what that means is that our admission system is 94% of our students were automatically admitted. They just, they had the scores, they were in. And they were found out very, very quickly. Now the other thing we don't do is rest on our laurels. Um, part of our stipulation with the RAI is that every two years we go through and evaluate it. So we pull in a lot of metrics from the universities and see, okay, is, our, is the threshold that we're using of 245 still the appropriate one? How are students performing? Um, one of our most recent biennial reviews uh, in 2017 is when we looked at the class rank issue and determined that we needed to drop class rank to stay ahead of that trend coming from high schools. So this is an example of some of the, the metrics that we looked at. This is breaking out, um, we've, we've got these different bins or columns for RAI scores. All the RAI scores above 245 are in blue. The ones below 245 are in gray. And it's looking at how those students performed um, did they return to the university that they started with by their third year? And it gives us, we, we're able to use this metric that does a pretty good approximation of whether the student graduated, because we know, for example, that like 88% of the students that return for that third year are gonna graduate from that institution. All right, well, uh, in, in summation, there are many benefits to the REI. It's, transparent, it's automatic, our formula is public, it allows you to plan out your high school classes well in advance, there's almost no weight to w whether you're in or not, there's very low uncertainty or stress, or at least it's relatively low, um, 
and there's a lot less need to hedge your bets by applying to lots of colleges. Uh, College Board recommends that students apply to five to eight colleges. There are some other online places that will recommend 12 to 15 in order to kind of maximize your chances. Um, and I think most students in Iowa don't need to go quite to that extent. They often, in often cases, they don't even apply to multiple regent universities. They know which regent university they want to go to. They know if they were automatically admitted. And so that's it, and they're done. All right, now I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the RAI, or if there's other questions regarding the admission system, um, we can please direct it to any of the three representatives here. Regent Bates, thank you. I, I got your name right. You did? Thank yeah. you. Good, good. Um, just out of curiosity, I know that there's more and more, and maybe you spoke to this and I missed it, but there are more and more students that are being homeschooled, and when they go to apply, how is that done? Because they don't have the core courses. I mean, they may have the core courses, but um, how? just explain that to me. Sure, I can give you a brief overview, and, and maybe wants to go into more detail. I think there's only 200 students that are coming from homeschool student homes. They're being homeschooled Homeschool. that are coming to the universities each year, and they would go through holistic review. So, do you? How do you compare the courses that they are being taught at home with the core courses that are at a uh, university or that you expect in a high school? Well. Um, we get quite a spectrum of homeschool applicants. You know, some of them have a very structured kind of curriculum. Maybe it's through some online curriculum, and, and some of them just, they're just taught everything at home. And so we get a wide variety of transcripts. And so it literally is an individual review. Uh, the one thing at Iowa State that we do is we, p we place a little added emphasis on their standardized test scores, because that's the one thing that we can look at where we can fairly compare them with the rest of our applicant pool. So, but it is, it's a very individual kind of process. Uh, we like to think we're a pretty homeschool friendly university. We don't require homeschool students to earn a high school equivalency diploma or anything like that, so. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, Regent Biker. Thank you. Are there uh, fees associated with the application, and what do they run? Well, right now, the current undergraduate application fee for domestic students is $40 at Iowa. I think it's 40 at all three of our institutions, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. There will be the Lakeside Lab presentation, and then we will have a, another presentation after that. President Richards, I want to introduce you uh, to Dr. Mary Skopik. She is the director, executive director of Iowa Lakeside Labs. She's been in that role about two and a half years. Um, but I want to make sure to note as well that uh, Dr. Skopik has been affiliated with the University of Iowa for quite some time prior to that, too, as a scientist and, and a teacher. And so we are very pleased to have brought her on board a couple of years ago and look forward to hearing her presentation. And as a student, I hope been here a long time. <laughs> Good afternoon, Regents. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you this afternoon. I know it's been a long day for you, so if it's helpful, you might think about sitting on a boat on West Okoboji, and it's sunny and wonderful outside. Um, I want to start off with a, a thank you for an opportunity to run this institution. Um, Iowa Lakeside Laboratory is a phenomenal resource for the state of Iowa and for the Board of Regents. And so I really appreciate that, that honor to, to work with those students. Every day I get to see the impact of Iowa Lakeside Laboratory on these fine individuals. Iowa Lakeside Laboratory has been in existence since 1909. And so in this photograph, uh, Thomas McBride, who obviously has been a, a well-known person around these parts for a long time, uh, went to Northwest Iowa and said, 
This needs to be preserved, and it needs to be a place for students to come and learn about the study of nature and nature. Um, at that time, even in 1909, he was worried that students spent too much time inside classrooms and not enough time outside really understanding how science works and the integrating of the different disciplines. Um, he was a phenomenal naturalist, and he is really our touchstone on how we should teach environmental science, biology, geology, um, all things outside. So it's also a preserve. So while it is an educational facility, we do have 147 acres that have been preserved in Northwest Iowa on West Okoboji. Uh, we're located on the west side of West Okoboji. And what's really amazing about what Thomas McBride saw was that we were on this transition between all these different ecosystems, whether it was prairies or wetlands or oak savanna, um, all kinds of amazing uh, vegetation out there and really transitioning from the east to the west. And he really believed this was a good place to come and study because it was like no other place in Iowa, but like every other place in, in Iowa. It had all those elements that really helped you understand the environment. And it's a little bit exotic, but it's only at the most five hour drive from Iowa City. So students don't have to spend a lot of money to go to uh, lakeside and, and leave the state, they can stay right here and get a really unique experience that gives them a little bit almost of a flavor of, of travel abroad, but still being in the state of Iowa. So we are fortunate to have that 147 acres um, for the students as well as the public in Northwest Iowa. Our mission then is really to provide those facilities and programming as a field biological station and then to support scientific education, education research and outreach um, in the region's uh, name. So we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing in the community that really help to highlight the presence of the regions in Northwest Iowa. This is a typical class. So this is an aquatic uh, ecology class outside, um, getting dirty and, and basically um, understanding how how it, how it is to be a field scientist, to go out there and be in that lake or that wetland and do that education and research at the same time. <clears throat> the lakeside model is a little unique. It is an immerse, immersion learning experience. So students are taking one class at a time. They're in that class from 8 to 4.30 every single day with that faculty member. And in that week, they get one semester hour. So a typical ecology class on campus that would take 16 weeks takes them four. It's very intensive, but I think it's a, a really wonderful model for those students because they're learning very intensively outside with that faculty member in classes that are relatively small. Our classes max out at about 15 students, uh, which is a really nice situation for that student to get that faculty um, teacher mentorship during that class as opposed to going away, maybe missing a class or two, they're really working with that, that faculty every single day. And we see these phenomenal relationships with their faculty members emerging during that time. We also try to really blend that lab and field work. So they're a little bit inside, but mostly outside, and really focusing on producing projects and publications. And I'll talk about that in just a second here. But just an example of couple of the things that the students are doing. So in our ornithology class, they're actually bird banding, going out and collecting those birds and banding them. We've got special permits so that they can do that on campus. And on the right-hand side, actually doing a prairie burn um, in, on our prairie so that we can see the regeneration of the prairie plants as a result of that burn. Um, very unique experiences for these students that tend not to get that in any other institution. The other thing we really try to focus on, in on are these collaborative and interdisciplinary classes. Because we're all housed at the same time in the same buildings, uh, we have an opportunity to let the classes work together. Um, one of my favorite experiences is on the left, there's a picture of our soil um, class. So Lee Burris from Iowa State University teaches soil formation. Um, he brings his drill rig up and the students have an opportunity to actually drill soil cores and describe them. And when they were sitting at dinner one night, the archaeology class said, well, you know, soil is really important to archaeology and understanding the, the uh, peoples that have been here in Iowa, um, why they might leave certain artifacts can be told in that soil story. And so they worked together to go out to, uh, as a class with both archaeology and soils to drill and do some exploration. And so those kinds of things happen at Lakeside because those faculty and students are sitting together during dinners and lunches and breakfast. They can plan for the class on the fly. They don't have to just sit and follow a very strict curriculum. 
Uh, we also have an acoustic ecology class, which is taught by Alex Braidwood out of Iowa State. Um, that class was actually featured in Iowa Outdoors because it's such a unique way of viewing uh, the, the natural world by looking at sound and the sound recordings that are taken underwater, in the prairies, early morning, late at night. Um, and so that class helps those students understand technology. So they're collecting that sound waves, um, that sound data. And there's a picture in the middle of, of uh, some of the, micros or the uh, microphones that they use. But then using that data to understand ecology. And so students that are maybe not getting a lot of data analysis in their typical biology class are getting that in something like acoustic ecology. And then the last class that I think was really interesting is helping scientists communicate better about what they're learning. Um, oftentimes scientists don't like to communicate with the public. They don't necessarily know how to communicate their message very well. And so we look to the people that are artists and writers to help them with that communication. And so we put together a class that was a science communication and data vis visualization class that helped the artists understand science and the scientists understand art in a way to communicate what we're all trying to understand about the natural world. And it was a really powerful experience. A little bit more about that, we really intend, uh, try to intend to bring science and art together in a number of ways. Um, one is our artist in residence program. We have artists that come for about two weeks. Uh, they are here doing their collaborative art, uh, but they also have an opportunity to work with the classes. And, and so that photograph that you see there is uh, Jenna Bonastelli. She's an MFA student here at University of Iowa. Uh, she came up for three weeks or two and a half weeks, and this is the ecology class. And the ecology class didn't know anything about paper making. And they said, well, can you make paper out of prairie plants? And she said, I don't know, let's try. So they went out to the prairie, they collected a bunch of different materials, and this is the class working together to understand how you make paper um, from an artist's perspective, but then also from a science perspective, and the different plant materials that you needed to make that paper. And so that was a really fun, um, one of a lifetime kind of experience for those students. Uh, we also have a writer in residence program. So we have three writers that will come up for three weeks this summer. Uh, they focus on their own writing, tends to be nature writing, but we don't make it uh, fit into that program necessarily. And then these writers are working again with the students, listening to their stories, talking about what they're experiencing out in nature, um, it's a very transformative experience for some of those writers who aren't terribly comfortable in nature. So they get to understand that world from a scientist, again, perspective and to feel very competent in being out in nature. Um, and so we're excited. We have um, two writers from Iowa State and one from the University of Iowa that will be coming up this summer to uh, work on their writing. And then we're also holding, hosting a writer's weekend in August where we basically just ask anybody who's interested in being a writer to come and spend time um, at, on the campus to work with each other, to talk to each other about writing and having that writing experience. So trying to find those opportunities for writers to get away from the hustle and bustle of the busy world and come out to a relatively quiet place at Lakeside Laboratory. One of the things that we have really focused on, and I think this has been a natural development for the courses, is to look at developing career-ready skills. Uh, I spent 18 years at the Iowa Department of Natural Resources hiring field technicians, hiring people to do water quality testing or biological processing. A number of students didn't really have much experience in their undergraduate, experience, in their undergraduate education with actually being in the field, doing the things that I needed them to do when I hired them at Iowa DNR. Um, at Lakeside, they're getting those experiences, partly because we're in the, the field uh, as a place of where we're at, um, but also because we, are, we have these facilities where you can go out and take a lake sample. If you don't have a lake nearby, that can be challenging, but um, we want to see these career-ready skills happen. And again, with a small class of 15, everyone gets to get their hands dirty. No one gets to stand in the back of the room and not volunteer to put on the waders, try and find the fish that are in the lake and see what's going on. So they really get those career-ready skills. And this is an example of a student who came to Lakeside, did some diatom research. Diatoms are just small microscopic organisms that are the basis of the food chain actually in lake systems, uh, the phytoplankton. And the student did some research and here she is presenting it at a national conference. And you can see there's something about sediment diatoms in West Lake Okaboji being presented at a national conference, um, really being supported by that very high quality um, class that we have at Lakeside. 
Uh, we see a number of publications coming out of these classes, um, whether they're in Iowa Academy of Science publications or small regional journals. Um, we, we see that kind of work happening, again, because the students are working very closely with their faculty during that time. The other thing I, I will point out is that I think a really nice model is the archaeology class. Um, this is a class where the Iowa Department of Natural Resources didn't have the resources financial resources to hire a company to come in and do an archeological assessment at a parking lot in, in an area where they wanted to build a parking lot near a, a state park. And so they approached the archeology span class about doing that initial assessment. Are there artifacts there? Do we need to take a different look at what we're gonna do with this parking lot? And for the last three years, this class has come up here and done that assessment for the Iowa DNR. The students, as you can see, are actually doing the dig. They're cataloging all those different artifacts. They're reporting on those artifacts to the Department of Natural Resources. And I think this is a phenomenal thing to put on a resume or to put on a graduate school application that they've actually done this work and, and not just in a theoretical way, but in a really tangible career ready way. Um, over my last two years, we've really been trying to expand our student research, and so um, this year we'll have about 15 different student research projects that are all going on simultaneously. <clears throat> um, I will point out the, the student on the left, uh, Sydney Weldon, was cataloging, digitizing, photographing thousands of specimens that we have at Lakeside Laboratory um, that are now available to researchers around the world. Um, those birds that you see there have actually been used in some research in Germany in the last uh, couple of months uh, because Sydney was able to make that available to people. And I believe she's actually presenting on her research today at Iowa State uh, with this dark data project. The student on the right was doing some algal toxin research. Um, she's been coming up for the last three years and is actually applying for, actually has been accepted at the toxicology program, PhD program here at University of Iowa. Her interest in toxicology really being um, spurred by doing that algal toxin research at, at Lakeside. And just a number of different faculty research projects that have been, have been going on. One of the really um, nice things that we can do for faculty at the region's institutions is if they need a place to stay, if they need a little bit of seed money, if they need uh, any kind of equipment, they can come to Lakeside and work with us and we can provide that in-kind resource for them. And so we've had a number of researchers come up over the last two years to do that, that work, and we're excited to see even more happen. Uh, we've got some drone research that will be looking at algal toxins this summer um, from researchers here at University of Iowa, and we've been doing some things with, with uh, Iowa State on the same topic as well. So we see some really nice collaborative work amongst the, the region's institutions at Lakeside. The last thing that I, I want to focus in, in on that I think is important is the community engagement piece. Um, people see Lakeside as a source for unbiased um, scientific information. So when they're looking for an answer to a question, and there's lots of resource questions in a lake area, they come to us for information, and they see us as the the, ability, the, the entity that can harness the Board of Regents uh, institutions. So if they have a question, they can come to me and I can say, for example, I can go to UNI and talk to somebody in the Center for Behavioral Research about that particular topic. And so they see us as that focal point for reaching out to the different universities. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been providing water quality testing for the lakes. We have, um, and I'll show you in just a second, uh, 11 different sites that are monitored around the, the Iowa Great Lakes. Again, that natural resource expertise, and then a variety of educational programming opportunities. Everything from pre-K to 12th um, grade uh, educational program and, and presence in, in Northwest Iowa. So we're excited about that community engagement piece. I think it really, really helps to, to make sure that the regions aren't forgot about in the Iowa Great Lakes. Uh, I mentioned the, the lake monitoring. This has actually been going on for 20 years at Iowa Lakeside Laboratory. And it's a citizen science program. So the, the State Hygienic Laboratory at the University of Iowa has a satellite office at Lakeside. Um, SHL runs samples that are uh, certified samples, water quality samples. And we have citizens that take their boats out to the ver various locations around the lakes, take those samples and bring them back to the lab. This information has become the cornerstone for a lot of planning and management for the lakes. Um, Spirit Lake, that big lake at the top there, um, Big Spirit Lake, it just underwent some source water protection planning. 
the major data source used for that source water protection planning was the citizen science program run out of Lakeside. Without that monitoring data, they would not have been able to come up with as good a plan as I think they did for that, that project. And so we're excited about being uh, a resource for the lakes in that way. And then there's just a number of other benefits for faculty members, for students, for staff at the region's institutions. Uh, we have facilities. One thing I'd like to note is we have about 40 buildings, 12 of which are on the National Historic Registry, built by the Civilian Conservation Corps or the, the McBride Cottage that is down by the lake was built in the late 1800s. So really historic locations. But in addition to that, places where faculty could come for a sabbatical if they need to do some pr uh, professional development work, class trips if you're heading out west we're a nice stop off uh, point for that we're not a we're not a long distance away so if you need just a long weekend for your class um, we we can pr uh, provide that as well as artist residencies conference locations um, any sort of facility that the faculty and staff might need we can provide that to them and then we really have strong local support and I can't say enough about the local community that provides a number of, of uh, funding opportunities for us whether it's scholarships or the internships or research funding or event support, uh, the Friends of Iowa Lakeside Lab are there to make sure that we can meet our mission. Um, in the scholarship realm in particular, uh, we've seen three new donations um, totaling for about $150,000 in just the last year and a half. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of interest in really supporting those scholarships right now um, and the inter internships as well. Uh, we will have somewhere around 15 to 18 interns that are uh, on campus this year, um, doing everything from helping to do that water quality monitoring to measuring aquatic invasive species to talking to the folks about, uh, last year we had flooding on the lakes, it was quite severe, and our interns were the first line of defense when people came to the lakes to be told, you have to keep your speed down, you have to make sure you don't damage the shorelines, and our students were standing there at the boat ramps telling them, uh, the visitors, what they needed to do to protect the lakes. So we're excited about those opportunities and, and really thankful for what the Friends of Lakeside provide to us. I know that you're at the end of the day, but I'm happy to take any questions, and it's not quite that green yet, but we're getting close. The snow is gone, so I'm happy to take any. The ice is gone. The ice left early this year. Well, not early. Average this year, so. Up at the north end of the East Lake. Um, so the, uh, talking about the curly leaf pondweed? That's it. Yes. So, <laughs> so the, the, uh, the side benefit of having the lakes improving is now that they're clear, we get an invasive um, species that is a rooted aquatic vegetation, curly leaf pondweed, grows from the bottom of the lake up to the top of the lake, and it's almost like trying to drive through a lawn. Uh, so what we're doing is working with Department of Natural Resources. There will be two things that happen. One will be the cutting of uh, a lane so that people can get through there, and then some herbicide treatment. Uh, we've been really working carefully to make sure that the herbicides don't move off site. And so the plan is to do a little bit more herbicide uh, treatment this year as opposed to cutting because it's more cost effective. And we didn't see any of the herbicide moving either down further in East Lake Okaboji or into West Lake or into the drinking water supplies. Yeah, so we, it's coming back. Yeah, we, we actually are going to be working with the high school there to do some underwater drone research to see how fast it's coming up. Uh, as well as some air drone research to see can we find the signature of the curly leaf pondweed. So we're doing a lot of drone work now to understand both from in the water and above, um, can we predict how bad it's going to be without waiting for it to just show up. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Larry? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm a retiree after today. But uh, really uh, telling the rest of my colleagues here that uh, this is a great asset. Sometimes I think that because it's up in northwestern Iowa, it, it tends not to, to get looked at. But we have all three universities that collaborate on this, right? Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and I can tell my colleagues here that they do a great, I've been over there, I've, I've spent a half a day. Uh, you will, if you can make that, <laughs> and David, uh, if you can make that and get a chance to be up in that area, you will see an education facility and young people that are unbelievable. Uh, and, I, and this is a part of the Board of Regents, and frankly, I'm a little sorry that 
that I didn't push a little harder sooner. Uh, we appreciate your support. To, to get you there, to get you here at this thing. And I guess the one thing I'd ask my colleagues as I walk out uh, that, that maybe once a year uh, they'll get a report and, and maybe reports from how the three universities collaborate uh, because as I, my understanding it is a collaboration function. And, and when you look at the, the water and, and, and the things that are being discussed in Iowa and nationally and worldwide about how we do these things, when I watch those young people train and some of the questions and some of the things that went back and forth there, I was frankly amazed. Uh, certainly they were brighter than I am, <laughs> than I am, I can tell you that. Well, I don't think that's true, but we appreciate your support, Regent McKibben. It's been phenomenal for me to see the transformation in these students that oftentimes, uh, sometimes they struggle. And I think sometimes they, they don't really know where, where they want to go with their careers. And they come and they really see how their studies are going to impact the world, how they can have a career with the studies that they have. And they are, they're part of a, a, ph a phenomena that's showing that water quality can get better in Iowa. I think the lakes are demonstrating that and we're seeing that happen. Uh, and that story needs to get out and those students I think are gonna do that for us. And I think that's a story that this board can continue to, to put out because uh, these are the future young people of the world, uh, the, of, the, of the nation and the state that are going to do these kinds of things for us. And I, there's no question about how bright they are. And, I'm sure a lot of them end up at our universities uh, as they carry on. Absolutely. And again, what's exciting is when you see those Iowa State, um, Iowa, and UNI students working together, so suddenly it sort of breaks down those barriers too. And so when we see students that suddenly decide to go to graduate school at a different, at a different institution that they currently are, it's because they've been talking to somebody that is at that institution. And so we see that wonderful collaboration in those classrooms. And one other quick question. Uh, there's a lot of traffic going north and south. <laughs> Uh, and, and I can tell my colleagues here that uh, uh, as I was the first time I went there, as I was looking for it, I wasn't paying attention, as my wife over there will tell you, and, and kind of watching to where I turned to get into it. And there was traffic, and I kind of came real close. And one of the things I talked to them about when I went there is, are you getting some signage, or are you getting something from, from uh, law enforcement or whatever, uh, because it concerned me about how it could be a family person, uh, um, gra grandmas and grandpas like I was and, and, and whatever for safety purposes. Have you had anything done about that? Yeah, we're working on our signage and trying to, first of all, move some of the trees back because we're, on, we're wooded and so trying to make sure that right. people see the signage and then making sure that, that we're um, providing more lighting. So yeah, we're working on that to make sure that people can see us in time because we are we're on a highway and then there's a bike trail right there. So we want to make sure that everyone's safe both on the bike trail as well as the highway um, with that signage. So we're working on trying to make sure that that's very vis visible to people coming. Is that, is that something that the board can help you with? or? I think it's just a matter of making sure that we're you know getting those signs out there. So it's just a matter of uh, where is the best place to put the sign because we're on a curve so figuring out that that well we have three main poles and trying to make sure that people can see those um, from the from the road so that they're not hidden in the trees and there's one that's been problematic because it's really hidden by the trees right. and so just moving that stuff it's just more of a uh, mechanical uh, construction thing it's not financial it's just getting that best design. And let traffic know that it's a yeah. slowing down place and a turning place and stuff for young people going in and stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah, and we welcome anybody to come spend time at Lakeside. We'd love to see, see you even for a few, few minutes if you're up in the Lakes area to stop by. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> And this is uh, both a ha happy and a sad day for all of us. So, uh, we have uh, anyone who's served on the Board of Regents knows serving as a region is more than a full is more than a full time job. Serving on this board is a privilege and a huge responsibility. Uh, we volunteer our time, and we are happy to do it. The honor of providing oversight, protecting the quality of education that our public universities provide is one that each board member takes seriously. While a great 
time commitment is very gratifying post to hold, uh, except maybe for an hour or two every once in a while. <laughs> Each of our three regents that we are saluting today have served with honor and distinction. We have formal resolutions of each region that will be entered into the record and posted on the board's website. But rather than just read them verbatim, I want to take a moment now to talk about some of the particulars of each region. And I'm going to give the opportunity for two of the regions that are here to have a parting statement. Uh, Sabash Sahai, Dr. Sahai joined the board on May 1st, 2013, and resigned last summer to spend more time with his family and caring for his patients. He served as the vice chair of the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics Committee. During his tenure on the board, we hired outstanding leaders at our institutions, hundreds of millions of dollars in capital projects with the Regents Enterprise were approved. Uh, we've tried to get Dr. Sahai to come here, and he's not mad, he's just working all the time. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge his uh, prior service. Larry McKibben, uh, Larry joined the Board of Regents on May 1st, 2013. This is his final meeting. He has served a, as chair of both the Investment and Finance and the UIHC committees and vice chair of both the Audit, Compliance, and Property Facilities Committees. One of his last la lasting legacies will be leading the board, will be that he led the board's tier process. That has led to strong and an increased collaboration between our institutions. Processes are in place that will lead us to savings for the years to come. He has been a stalwart in fighting to keep costs for students down as much as possible and a strong advocate for first generation students. In addition, he chaired our tuition task force in 2017, which has led us, led the board to, our, to adopt our predictable five year tuition plan and I believe that that will be an important legacy that Larry has left with to our board. I'd like everybody to give him a little bit of it. <laughs> Larry, do you have anything you'd like to say? <laughs> We, you oh, are yeah. talking to oh, a former senator and a, <laughs> when you talk to a former senator and a lawyer, you, you shouldn't bring that up. You, you know that from the past. Uh, just a few comments. Uh, uh, first of all, this is, this is always a, an up, upside and a downside about having this final, uh, final meeting today. But I guess when you think back on uh, my my time that I spent in, in public service, it's about a third of my lifetime now, and, and this has been so important. A lot of time that all of my colleagues spend uh, with us because we have a good team uh, of leadership and, and group here. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is to the presidents and the administrators that are here and the faculty and staff of the three universities that we have, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that from where I started six years ago to where it is today, it's no, there's no comparison. Uh, the fact that uh, when I started, uh, of course, I, I attended all three universities, uh, but you know, when I was here at law school, I, I probably in football games, I uh, know who I was supporting in football games and stuff, and I sensed when I started this that 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 still exists in our three universities, that, that the things that went on inside our university is almost like what we thought about them from an athletic standpoint at the three universities. And, and all of a sudden, as a region, I picked that up. And, uh, and I was so blessed when I got to, to, to chair the tier committee because collaboration, working together, saving money, 
collaborating on what we buy and, and do and how we can work uh, with faculty and staff and, and do things and have three great presidents and, and folks work together uh, to make this better, as well as the faculty and staff that are here. Uh, that's what I'm leaving with. I'm leaving with that at a time that, that I know that there's a great group of people uh, sitting behind me and then David coming on and, and the two others that are uh, Milton and Jim that were reappointed. Uh, no doubt in my mind that, that the next years are going to be great years and, and gonna, we're going to through difficult times and I was in the Senate at the times that, that budgeting and I guess it's continued with me for the last six years here uh, from a budgeting standpoint and I understand what you all are, are, are dealing with. Uh, but I really believe, and, and when I heard the president uh, here tell us, you know, what are the next five years going to be, and we're developing a, a business metric as to how we're going to run these universities at a high level, uh, is fantastic. And the faculty and staff, and there aren't a lot of faculty and staff here, but uh, uh, fantastic folks that, to visit. Uh, one of the best things that I did was take time and come to the visit the universities, uh, visit faculty and staff, go to some classes. Uh, phenomenal to go to some classes uh, and be there, so uh, no question. Uh, I know that you're going to continue to do things well, and, and that's one of the reasons that makes it easier for me to leave today, is because I know that the ball's running, and uh, I know that leadership that we've got and faculty, great faculty and staff, it's still painful to me uh, to know that uh, uh, we, and the, the most difficult thing for our leadership is when we have faculty and staff that don't get income uh, raises and that we lose great researchers and we lose great faculty and, and staff to other universities that come in and steal them away from, you know, uh, from Iowa, which of course, as an Iowa boy, it's the greatest place to live in the world. and. Uh, to lose those people as we went through uh, and working on that. But I, I think, uh, President, I think you and the leadership team are doing a great job. And I, I look forward to reading about, you know, tuition and how you're handling it, how you're working with the legislature. I really appreciate the time you take with the legislature. And, and I know that you spend a whole lot of time over in the Capitol and stuff. And, and, and Mr. Braun, uh, both of you do that. and are on our staff people to do that over there. I think it's having headway. And I think in the next few years as you're doing things, I think y'all are gonna do things uh, that are great for our students and our universities. So with that, it's, uh, and the other th person I have to say thank you is sitting, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Over the time that I travel to meetings and, and have my law practice and things that I have to do, my lovely bride takes care of that, and that helps. I, <clears throat> I probably shouldn't have said that, but I had to. So, thank you. I'm happy you said that. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate everything. Uh, Rachel Johnson. Uh, Rachel began her term as a student regent on the board on May 1st, 2015. Today is also her final board meeting as she has resigned effective at the end of this month. She graduated last year summa cum laude from UNI. She received the prestigious Truman Scholarship in 2017 and is currently working as the resident scholar for the Truman Scholarship Foundation. She helped found and served as the chair of the board's campus and student affairs committee <clears throat> and also served as vice chair of the academic affairs committee. She has a passion for public service and has been a strong advocate for our region institutions. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. 
You have the floor. Thank you, President Richards. Um, I said most of my prepared comments at lunch, um, but just to say a couple more things. When I first started this, I had no idea what I was getting into, and I didn't realize how life-changing this experience would truly be. Um, went into college thinking that I would be a K-12 teacher and have the utmost respect for our educators um, that are in the K-12 system, but after serving on the board, I quickly realized that um, I was meant to take a different path, and higher education has become a, such a piece of my, of who I am and of what I want to do. Um, so I want to thank all of our university presidents, staff, faculty, the board staff, um, because without you all, I wouldn't have figured that out, and I wouldn't be um, out in D.C. working for the Truman Foundation. I doubt I would have even applied for the Truman Scholarship. Um, so this exposure to public service so early in my career has really changed my life. So I want to thank every single person for their role in that. Um, Iowa, sorry. <laughs> Iowa is so lucky to have every single one of you working tirelessly every day for the betterment of education across the state to serve the students and to promote education. It's incredible the work that every single one of you do and we wouldn't be here without it. Um, this is an experience I'll never, ever forget. Um, I've made so many great memories, met so many phenomenal people. Um, I've made connections that are lifelong friendships. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. It's been a phenomenal four years, and I look forward to serving the state again in some future, in some capacity in the future because the state has done so much for me and it's, it's been a phenomenal experience. So thank you, every single person. Thank you, Rachel. I also want to recognize a new regent who, unless he has different thoughts after today, <laughs> uh, he, David Barker, who is, a, is from Iowa City and I suppose some of you know him. And uh, we have, anticipate and appreciate your uh, commitment already. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other business to come before this board, the meeting of the Board of Regents State of Iowa is adjourned. Uh, I believe Bruce Harold is committed to come over and talk with the press with me. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm trapping him. No.